Scruffy Audio Network. Hey, uh, this is a real special show for me today with uh, my new father that has taken me under his wing the last 23 years, Mr. Big Jim Haslam. How you doing? I'm doing fine, Charles. How you doing? Oh, uh, this is a blessed Friday having having the big man in here. So this is going to be a cool, cool show. I'm really excited about it because with people like you not in my life, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I wanted to humbly say thank you for that. Hey, the feeling's mutual, buddy. Well, you know, and, and, and it's a two-part show today. We're going to talk about the one question I ask all my athletes. And the one thing I do ask real quick, Mr. Haslam, is don't break my English apart. I know I don't speak well. <laughs> And I'm unshaven my hair, so, you know. That's well, what, this isn't televised, is it? It, it could be YouTube. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, okay. There's, so, then we need to work on your appearance. So we need well, to work Anna on Hannah said she was in charge of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I fail miserably at that. I don't know why he keeps me around. You could never play for the Yankees when George Steinbrenner was there, could no. you? No, or, or General Nealon. Okay, no, definitely not General Nealon. Yeah, so he could tell stories after stories. All right, I open up the question with my athletes. When did you know you were different? With CEOs, doctors, like your son who was on here, Jimmy Haslam Jr., when did you know you wanted to be in the oil, gas, convenience store business? Well, it was uh, back when I was growing up, your life was structured. You went to high school, then I was fortunate enough to come to college because I had a football scholarship. Then you go in the service, this was during the Korean War, and you had to go into service for two years. And when you came out of the service, for the first time I realized in my life, you know, I wasn't in school, I wasn't playing ball, I wasn't in the service, I didn't have to get a job. And uh, I, it's kind of interesting. I, uh, I, I kind of wanted to be a high school football coach. But it was February of 1955. Jimmy was almost a year old. And when I talked to him, I uh, could have had a couple jobs, but they wouldn't start paying until August. Well, that wasn't going to work. And then I interviewed for two jobs in Knoxville. One was selling advertising at a TV station. and The other was working for a, a man named Sam Claiborne, the father who had a chain of gas stations. And uh, being uh, <laughs> the, the very intelligent person uh, that I am, I thought the TV wasn't going to make it. So I decided to go uh, work for this guy who had a chain of gas stations. And after two or three years, I realized that I really liked this kind of thing, and I wanted to start our own chain of gas stations. So in 1958, we opened our first pilot gas station. Do you have any regrets of not taking a football coach job? (laughs) No. (laughs) Jimmy was talking one time when... uh, Lane Kiffin was here, and Monty Kiffin was the defensive coordinator. And Jimmy said, well, somebody asked Jimmy, what was happening if you and your dad were, uh, were, he was head coach, or you were head coach, and one of y'all was the coordinator? And he said, and he said, well, if I were the head coach and he were the coordinator, I would have fired him at halftime, but he'd have quit five minutes before I fired him. <laughs> <laughs> No regrets. <laughs> no regrets. All right, so uh, take us through that timeline because I know I've heard tons of different stories of, you know, traveling with you all over the place to football games and wherever we go and working out. Is, the stories are amazing, but if you could put it together of like, you know, I think you started your first one in Virginia? Yeah, uh, I was – the man I was working for was a real good guy. He, he taught me everything I knew about business and, and – gas station business, and and uh, he had given me the, uh, a small bit of ownership in a company that he just started called Sale uh, Oil Company. And so when 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 I when 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 I left and started our own business, I agreed to him that we wouldn't compete with him. So Virginia was kind of wide open. So we uh, our first location, we bought a piece of property in Roanoke, Virginia. And I was coming home one day, and uh, there was a location in Gate City, Virginia, which is really across the state line from tennis, from Kingsport, Tennessee. And uh, gasoline was cheaper there, set the taxes, uh, cigarettes were cheaper. Uh, that's by, that was back before there was any kind of legalized liquor in Tennessee, and there were state liquor stores in Virginia. So everybody 
came and crossed the line, and there was a, I was coming home, I just went out there, and there was a gas station that was closed. It was owned by a fellow named Vernon Bays, and I pulled in there, and I said, Vernon, what's going on? You aren't selling gas. We're just selling cigarettes. And he said, well, uh, I, I, you know, I, I have trouble paying for my gasoline. I said, well, why don't you sell me this location? And I, I said, what do you want for it? And he said, $10,000. And I said, well, I'll give you six. And this was a Thursday. And he, and he said, could you close Monday? And I said, yes. So we went up there on Monday. It was November 20th, 1958. And we started selling pilot gasoline. And we've been selling pilot products, now diesel fuel and food and all those other things ever since. So come, uh, let's see, so, uh, today's the 4th, so that's 27 and uh, uh, 27 days and not 20. So 47 more days, we'll be 61 years old. And and he's a whiz with numbers, as you would know, Laura. His, his uh, Batman and Robin are here. She's she's takes care of him now. Um, so you didn't do anything in Knoxville at first. Everything was in Virginia. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then we, we opened our first store in Knoxville, which is where our convenience store is on the campus. We opened it oh about two years after we got started. I I I got along so well with Sam Claiborne. And I told him I had a chance to get this store in Knoxville. He said, "Go ahead." And so, but our real Tennessee expansion didn't start until the middle 60s. So the one on Cumberland on the corner is the first one? First one in Knoxville. First yeah. one in yeah. Knoxville. Now it's been torn down and remodeled seven or eight times. And so those are called the C stores, correct? Cause convenience stores. I yeah. feel like I could uh, not run Pilot, but be a part of it. I've, I've been around it. I could know that uh, Mountain Dews are a big seller at the convenience stores and Marlboro Lights. I know those numbers pretty well. <laughs> I don't know if they're still going on. That one small one right there on North Shore, that that sea store, the parking is incredible. Yeah, and and they didn't anticipate that. Uh-huh. And the one at Cedar Bluff, uh, by Dunkin' Donuts, that pilot, uh-huh. the parking there and the traffic, you know, oh, it's 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 a mess there. So, so again, this timeline is going to be amazing for everybody out there listening. Is you get, how do you know? You know, you talk to every businessman, you know, we know them all here and I train all the DeBusks and you guys and, and Brian DeBusk would always say, what's enough? And he would say, just a little bit more. When do you know, like the C stores, did you have a number? Like, did you know when you started that first one for $6,000 that you wanted to go from here to here to, did you have numbers? Like I want 30, I want this, I want this. Well, uh, well, when I was in the University of Tennessee, I majored in finance, and you had to write a term paper. And I wrote this paper that uh, we'd start this company uh, in 1958, and that by uh, 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 2019, we'd have 650 travel centers and be in, uh, uh, in 47 states and, and four provinces in Canada. I wrote this all out. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I tell you, we have we had no idea or no plan. We started off with gas stations in the uh, uh, 1970 or 71. We figured out, hey, this isn't going to work. We had to pay so much for the property, so we got in the convenience store business. And in 1980, we uh, we opened our, our first travel center. In November of 19, we got the idea in 1980. In November of 1981, we opened our first travel center in Corbin. They've evolved. It was at first just a convenience store with diesel pumps behind, and now it is what you see today. It's it's a big location. We can park usually a hundred trucks. Uh, we obviously we sell gasoline. We have a convenience store inside so to speak with the same things you have in a convenience store we have a restaurant we have wendy's we have arby's we have more subways than anybody in the country uh, uh we have uh, some taco bells we have some mo's we have our own food concept pj fresh so it's come a long way from that one single gas station and you have showers, and we have showers. Yeah, you, yeah, you can stop and get a shower. Yeah, I need, I need to shower more. But when we stop, and we have the, a barber shop. Too. Have, <laughs> <laughs> let me guess, Floyd's working. <laughs> <laughs> 
when can I interview you? <laughs> Shoot, that would be horrible. Nobody wants to hear me. That's crazy. Excuse me. All right, so you take me through. I remember being with Jimmy a lot of the times. Uh, two things I was with a lot when we would bike the bu- boulevard, you and I would, and Bill was running for mayor. And Laura, you you know, you would just die some of the things. I'd have to hold the bike up while you have to take a phone call because it was very serious about Bill being mayor. And then Jimmy would always have to go outside and take phone calls when he was doing the merge with Flying J. Uh-huh. Take me through that for a minute because that was a that's not like something overnight. That the was Flying J. Yeah. Well, uh, Flying J uh, was our biggest competitor to company out of out of. Uh, 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 Ogden, Utah, and uh, it uh, it was started by a, a man named Jay Call, who's a little younger than I am, and he was an airplane pilot, so he called it Flying J. They were our, our biggest competitor, and uh, they also had a couple refineries, and they got in some other businesses, and uh, we had talked to them a couple times in the uh, early 2000s about making some kind of combination, but, uh, but, but nothing ever came of it. And then in 2008, during the recession, and the banks started tightening up, and they had uh, some issues with their refineries and their crude oil that wasn't hedged, and they had to file for, uh, for Chapter 10 bankruptcy. So we, uh, during the time, we talked to them, and we worked out a deal where uh, we would loan them some money so they could come out of bankruptcy, and then we combined the two companies. It was a very difficult deal to work out. That took uh, maybe six to nine months because Conoco Oil Company owned an interest in it, and we had to take them out, and it was a very complicated deal. And nobody but Jimmy Haslam could have worked it out, I'll be honest with you. He had the you know, he just was going to get it worked out and worked, worked, and worked. Well, then we had to get the financing worked out, which wasn't easy, but we were able to work it out. But then we had to get the government approval, since you're combining two companies that were competitors. And that took the Federal Trade Commission six or nine months. So from the time we started, it was about a year and a half process to get it all worked out. But it's been good. Uh, the uh, the Flying J people, the uh, uh, J Calls family, Crystal Maglet and her uh, uh, brother uh, uh, have an interest now in, in pilot travel centers, and it's been a very good combination for everybody. So would the term, um, they were your number one competitor, right? Uh-huh. So would that be like, if you can't beat them, join them? Well, it, 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 no, it, well, it was more uh, a combination, and you see it. So much in business today where two companies uh, 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 can have all kinds of efficiencies by working together. And we, you eliminate a lot of your overhead like that, and it just it just makes a more efficient uh, a company when you can put companies together. And all kinds of companies are doing it now. And, and the number one thing why they do it would be? Well, well why you do it is is you can lower your costs. I mean, if you've got this gym and you've got two more gyms, you can use the same infrastructure. You can have these two people doing things at other locations, and so it won't cost you as much per client to operate at, 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 at the three gyms as, you, as it would at one gym. It would cost you more to take care of that one person. So our customers are better off because it costs us less to be able to take care of the customers because they're because of the economies of scale. So you could expand by keeping the same infrastructure. Yeah, that's exactly right. God, I wish I listened more in school. That's you, smart. Hey, you've done pretty well. Well, I mean, it's just been a hard work, but I would not think I wouldn't even think that, you know, because people have asked me to franchise the building to Nashville and you know that you've I've yeah. taken all my business things through you guys, and they're like, "Well, how do you duplicate another Patron in Nashville? How does he sit in that well, you, building?" You have a brand, and your brand is a little different. Your brand is you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I mean, it's it's a little hard. It's a little harder to do that than our brand is. You know, we can go out to uh, 
you know, Sacramento, California, and our brand is known, and we can take that brand there. We don't have to be there. If you went and started a place in Sacramento, California, you'd have to be there. And that's that's funny you say that, and that's a, a segue into the next is I do think about that when I drive through the pilots on like a Sunday, Laura, it's crazy how you think like that, owning your own business and being so hands-on and being called out all the time of like, you got to be hands-on. Knowing that like they're at the football game Sunday and this is running this way, that would drive me nuts not knowing that would run that way. And the only reason I, you know, you say that is Jimmy's always going, how the toilets look, how the bathrooms look. Every time you go through something, is that something you put into well, his yeah, head? Well, yeah, I mean, Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, with yeah, that? exactly. I'm saying. And you know, we're first of all, we're twenty four seven, three sixty five. We never close. When Laura became my assistant, I said, "Laura, get twenty four seven, three sixty five. You know, and so you know, uh, Natalie will say, "Well, you can't call her Sunday afternoon or." Monday night at 10 o'clock. I said, yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> She's like the yeah. store. She's always open. So right. you have to have that, you know, you have to know and you have to have standards. And if you go into a, say you're driving out, uh, let's say you're driving up 81 and, and you stop uh, at, at our store at, at Straw Plains or, or White Pond, say it's the first one where 81 breaks off. And, uh, you have a, a a good experience. So you're up in Virginia, you're in Withful, Virginia, and you say, oh, there's another pile of flying jets. So you stop in there, and the restrooms aren't clean. Well, your next stop might have been up in Maryland at Hagerstown. You're going up 81, and there's a pilot, and you say, hmm, I don't want to stop there. Last time I stopped at a pilot, the restrooms weren't clean. So when you have a chain operation, your chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So we, we, <laughs> we have three things we, we, we talk about. When, when a customer, when a, a guest comes in, we, we, ha- we call what we call meet and greet. You walk in the door, how are you today, sir? What can I help you with? Smile, meet and greet. The second thing we have is call for help. If if one of the lines is long at, at, a, at, at where the cashier is, he or she needs to, and it's, it's not, <laughs> they need to call somebody to come get on the next cash register so people don't have to wait. And the third are restrooms. And we grade everything every month on those, those three things. And last month, for example, our restrooms came out 90%. Well, I don't think you can ever be a hundred percent, but ninety percent is pretty good. So it's an A. It's an A on some yeah, scales, it's an right? A. It's an A. But ever since we started in business, we've talked about having clean restrooms. And you know, there are three reasons people stop on the interstate: one to get fuel, two to eat, and three to go to the restroom. And if you want them to stop for your fuel, fuel and your food, you're going to have to have clean restrooms. So that's where it came from. That's where it came from. That's pretty neat. <laughs> now, do you constantly, I know what you and Jimmy do, and he told me you guys had a great time a couple of weeks ago, just got in the car and, and drove. Yeah. And, you know, he's loving spending time with you. But you do it, and I know Jimmy does it. You still are hands-on because you go through all the stops. I remember, I don't know if Jimmy does it anymore. He's so busy, but he used to be dropped off. Yeah. on the West Coast and drive yeah. back and stop at all the mm-hmm. stores. The hands-on thing, like I was talking about, do you are you constantly thinking, I hope this store is running efficiently right now yeah, while and, I'm watching and, a game? Yeah. You, or, or, or do you have the right people in place well, and go, I'm out well, of it? Well, we can't do it, okay? We can't all do it. You have to, have, you have to start at the store level, at, uh, you know, at the store level, then... Uh, the, the, uh, we have the region level. There are 10 stores in the region and the division level. There are seven regions and then so on. Then, uh, uh, and then Jason Nordine runs all the stores. Well, you got to be strong at each level. And, and you have to have the same standards at each level. And we have to constantly tell people what the standards are. It's funny. Of course, I don't go out to visit stores like I used to, but they always know when I go in the store, first thing I do is go to the restroom. And sometimes 
somebody will see me come in the store and they'll come start talking to me and try to get me to wait for a minute and somebody else runs in and makes sure the restrooms are clean. You know that. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. You know, and but what we have to make sure of is that they think we're coming every day because we aren't the ones that are important. They think we're important, but the customer's important. And that restroom has to be clean for that customer, not for Jimmy or me or Ken Parent or Jason Nordine, all the the, the management people in the, co- in the company. We aren't the important ones looking at the restrooms. The customer, our guests are. And so that has to be part of the culture. Uh, I, I've even heard that they call ahead. Oh, yeah, and they say, call hey, ahead. he's looking at stores, he yeah. ca- he's coming up, and then they, it, it's crazy. So you know the human behavior of that. That's why. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know. Once we get in one area, the word's out. The, the word's out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's amazing. I think that's pretty cool. All right, so you, you go through, now where is it? Now, I know Jimmy was having his things going on with Canada. Mm-hmm. And knowing the structure is a little bit different yeah. up there, and even we, when I had Jimmy on, we even talked about New Jersey of uh, still uh, full service, full service, and yeah. that's how Jimmy started pumping gas at full service. Yeah. When did all that switch to where New Jersey still like that? But well, there 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 are a couple states, New Jersey and Oregon, where yeah, they have to pump the gas. Uh, Self service kind of started in the uh, in the seventies, I guess. And uh, when we first became aware of it, we had a store in Hickory, North Carolina, and different states had different laws, but North Carolina had it where you could uh, uh, have self-service. So we took the store in Hickory, and gasoline was then selling, you know, 50, 60 cents a gallon. And and, uh, we... Got, for self service, we had it two cents less, which was a big deal if you're if you're selling fifty six cents a gallon. So I went over to Hickory to see how he was doing. So one night I was over there, and it was a spring night, and it was about seven o'clock at night. And this lady came up, and she was driving an upscale car, and she was obviously going out. She had cocktail attire on, you know, nice dress high heels and everything. And she got out and she started pumping her gas herself. And I went over there and I said, ma'am, would you mind if I ask you a couple of questions? And she, I said, I'm with this company. And she said, no, go ahead. And I said, now why in the world? You're obviously going out. You're well-dressed. Why are you pumping your own gas? And she pointed at our sign and then the sign at the gas station across the street. And she said, Listen, buddy, for three cents a gallon, I'll pump my own gas. Well, I, we learned a lesson then. That <laughs> people were very willing to pump their own gasoline. It was not a problem. And so we, we, we came from a full-service company to a completely self-service company almost overnight. And the only place we waited on these places where the states made you do it. Wow, so you cut out employees. No, we, we cut out the people pumping, pumping gas. the gas. You right. have to so, have the cashiers inside. Right, so yeah. they they would report on shifts just like the cashiers that, that's inside. That's exactly right. Right. Yeah. And they would have, it was interesting, <laughs> they would have what they called a changer. And back then, most business was cash. You had a little changer that had pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters in it. And somebody come in and get Three dollars a gas, they just give you three dollars. But if they got if they filled it up and it was five fifty two, well they gave you a ten dollar bill and you gave them four dollars and then you gave them forty eight cents. You punch three three pennies, a nickel, a dime, another nickel and a quarter and, and handed it to And them. it was the the gas station yeah. guy that did that, right? Yeah, it was the gas like station guy out there doing on the island that yeah. did it. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. father used to pump gas, and yeah. I always thought he was super rich. He'd drive by the gas station, and he'd have all his money yeah. Oh, yeah. in his pocket because he was doing change. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that crazy? Yeah, that's right. So take me, if you could share the one story that you've told me 28,000 times about your first cell phone in your car, and then 
to, uh, phone booths. Ben, you would remember this at 25 years of age. But this cat, this big cat right here, had to make all his calls in phone booths that weren't too, uh, they weren't like his restrooms. At well, Pilot. yeah, back. Um, he had the big the, case phone, like well, the huge box Well, <laughs> the two stories. Back before you had cell phones and everything, uh, you had to ha- you had to use. They were just pay telephones, and most all businesses had them. But there'd be you'd be driving down the highway, and there'd be te- a, a pay phone, a little booth you could stop in, and any any place the rest centers on the interstate, airports just lined with 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 pay phones. And back when it was just me at Pilot, and there were all kinds of decisions to make, we were doing all the pricing ourselves and everything. And uh, everybody knew that I'd call the office at 11 and 4, and they'd have they'd call in there because they couldn't call me the four cell phones. So they'd c- call in the office, and, and I'd, stop at a cell, I'd stop at a phone booth, and, you know, I'd write down the five calls I'd make and have to make them and call and everything. Well, finally... A car phone came out, and it was not a cell phone. It was a radio. Was it a CB? <laughs> well, it was just a great big radio, and it had different channels. And like you had three channels in Knoxville, and you go out of town, and you'd punch other channels. And, of course, anybody could listen to you. But the funniest thing ever, when I first got this thing, I had a good friend, Jimmy Smith, you knew him, and he ran a big bank here in town, and... <laughs> One day I pulled in his driveway, and his bedroom was upstairs, and he always worked a lot in his bedroom on weekends. And I, as I was coming up his driveway, I called him, and I was talking to him. And then I pulled down his driveway, and I said, look out the window. And he said, my gosh, somebody's got stolen your car. It's sitting out there. <laughs> but it, it was, and these phones... If you weren't in the car, it would blow your horn. And one time, Natalie and I were at a graveyard thing at a funeral, and I'd forgotten and left it on. And all of a sudden, this horn starts honking. Everybody looks around. Well, it's got to be me. I go over there. Natalie about to disown me. (laughs) But you had a lot of funny stories. Yeah, I mean, with the phone and the pay phone, and then even we talked about you know, because I'm so intrigued with people like you that started a business, you know, and, and, and now Jimmy's taken it to other levels of um, you didn't have planes back then to check no, on. No, I drove all the time. You, so been. you were telling me you put on, what, 60,000 miles? One year I drove 50,000 miles in a car. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, it's... So you me, were hands-on back then. Oh, yeah. But let me just tell you one thing. Anybody who's achieved a modicum, that means small. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pops. Thank you so much. Small I'm sure amount. everybody knew that but me. <laughs> I couldn't spell it either. I can't say it or spell it, so we're going to go with small. A modicum of success. Was that Hebrew? What is that? Uh, back to, anybody who's received a small amount, any small, even a small amount of success in business and says they aren't lucky is not telling you the truth. You know, you have to have certain breaks in your life to do well. And we were fortunate. We got in the business that suited us. We had a lot of, of good things happen. You mentioned the Flying J. They had a hard time. They were bankruptcy. We were able to, to take advantage of it. You know, I'm basically a product of football. And we all know General Nalen's game maximums. And they apply to business. The team that makes the fewest mistakes wins. That doesn't say, if you don't make mistakes, you aren't doing anything but you can't make more mistakes than other people. And then play for and make the breaks, and one comes your way, score. We had a break in the Flying J, and we were able to take advantage of it. We got in the travel center business by a really uh, (laughs) break. Uh, uh, There was a guy named Kenny Pritchard. He was an Amico oil jobber in Jackson, Mississippi. He played football Tennessee after I did, but I knew him. And a guy from Marathon Oil Company said, you won't believe what Kenny Pritchard has done in Slidell, Louisiana. What's that? Well, he's taken a convenience store and he's put a bunch of diesel pumps behind it. I said, well, that's the silliest thing I've ever heard of. But where is it? 
And he said, Slidell, Louisiana. So Jimmy and I flew down there, saw it, copied it unmercifully. It wasn't our idea at all. Built the first one in Corbin, Kentucky. And now we're the biggest operator travel center. Now, would that have happened if we hadn't heard about this and I hadn't known the guy and he's willing to share the information? You know. Lucky break. Lucky break. It's, you see what I mean? Yeah, and you don't hear that anymore from social media. or oh, and, no. and nobody want, we talked about that. Nobody wants to talk about beginning. Or I don't know a lot right now, and I'm just beginning. Nobody yeah, says that. Yeah, nobody yeah. says lucky break. And I was just thinking when yeah. he was saying lucky break, for me to train professional athletes, my lucky break came with Chad Pennington. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had, you, you had a guy who was first-round draft choice. Right. You know, then it and, steamrolled, and yeah, that, that was yeah, my lucky and, break. And, yeah, and Todd. You and know, Todd. best baseball player ever come out of Knoxville. Lucky break. Lucky break. I mean, just, they, they came to you, but, you know. Lucky break. Lucky and break. it worked out. Yeah, and they yeah lucky became break. Good. And you can take almost anything that happens, and to do any good, you have to have a lucky break. I love that. Can I but, trademark that? Yeah. It, it's pretty cool. Lucky break. Yeah. and But the but thing is, then you have to take advantage of it. You like a I mean? turnover. Yeah, that's what you're talking turnover. about in the football yeah, world. Yeah, the turnover. I mean, we better score. Yeah, if there's a turnover on the, you pick it up on their 30 yard line. Now you've gotten a break, but if 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 you don't score, if you just and if you just get a field goal, you got to take advantage of. You got to get a touchdown. You got to. You're just going to get so many breaks. So you got to score when you get a break. And then remember the third game maximum. If at first a game or a break goes against you, don't slow down or get rattled, put on more steam. So in business, bad things are going to happen Explain. to you. We've had some bad things happen to us at Pilot, but we just got to keep going. And it's like in football. If you get behind, you don't give up, you know. So don't quit. Don't quit. Don't, and don't you're quit. going to be faced with adversities, you're going failures. You're going to be faced with adversity. But you're saying your failures shouldn't outweigh your successes. No, you, can, you can't have more failures and successes. And then just brag about that, right? That's and go, hey, I failed, I failed, but I'm that's still right. going. Well, what are yeah. you going with? No, How yeah, succeed, yeah, that's right? right. But you got to have a lot more successes. But you can't let a failure, ooh, I'm quitting. You know what I mean? And and you never thought, I mean, you're, you're 88, right? Mm-hmm. You're correct, 88. Have you ever thought about doing anything different? Oh, gosh, no. No, you love I'm so it. lucky. You know, the good happened. Love you know, it. Really You're a people person and, and, yeah. and, and, and so smart. No, so it's not smart. You lucky. are smart. I'm lucky. Smart. I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the lucky break. Did you ever... I know where Jimmy is now with the Browns and with the Steelers, but, you know, there's so many so many rumors around of, of you trying to own a team before that. Well, you know, uh, you know our family. We love sports. And long before we got this, Jimmy got the interest in the Steelers, we had talked to <laughs> one of the funniest things, you know, Jimmy. One time he said to me, you know, we ought to buy the Yankees. And this was a long time ago. And I said, well, gosh, they want, of course, they're worth billions now. But I said, they want and they worth two hundred million or some great big figure. Then he said, "Well, well, uh, maybe we could lease them." <laughs> <laughs> but we talked to, and I don't think it's any secret. We talked to the guy that owned the Minnesota Vikings. We talked to the, the guy, the man that owned the, uh, the uh, New Orleans Saints. We never got anywhere. I've and, heard the uh, Saints. What I've heard the yeah, Saints. and we before. talked to the guy that owned the Minnesota Vikings. A uh, red uh, guy from Texas, red. I'll think of his name in a minute. But, you know. It, but that was a while ago. That was a long time ago. A long ago. time ago. Yeah. But it's it's been on our radar for a long time. It has. Yeah. 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 And then the way Jimmy talked about how it came. Anything with the Titans? Uh, yeah, we we talked to Bud Adams while he was still alive, but never could work anything. I out. met Bud Adams. Yeah, I was with Mr. Haslam. We went to his well, we, box. You, you ate all the shrimp. And he drank all the wine. <laughs> <laughs> we were, I didn't we, eat all the shrimp, we, we but I didn't drink in, any wine. We were up in his box, and Charles, they had all this good-looking shrimp, and it's all gone. What happened to it? Charles ate it all. I was in my heavy days. I was still growing. I was still growing. But that's the thing is watching Mr. H move around then to other people his age. And um, I guess we could segue into the, the health and wellness of – I could talk all day with him. It's like talking to my dad. So, How um, long have you been training 23 years, 
23 years and I'll be doing the business 29 years this spring in 1991. Um, but again, I mean, even in the box with Bud Adams and those those older gentlemen, Mr. Haslam, a.k.a. Pops, looked so different and acted and moved so different than a lot of people. And moving pretty slow now. Well, and and <laughs> it, it, that's amazing. And, and we're starting a new podcast of talking about that. And I appreciate you coming on the show. And, Laura, thank you so much for bringing him here for that. Because of course, we got lost. Got lost. And that was my fault. I'll take it. Laura was getting edgy on the phone. I'm like, here it comes. Here. She must be from the north. So or she got handed off to me. Yeah, I go here. Talk to She's yelling at me. <laughs> she's my mother yelling at me. Is we were down in the, in in your in your weight room at Pilot, which is an awesome wellness center, and I was training your daughter and and Bailey, and you came in and we were talking, doing some balance stuff, not much, but just talking, and it just hit on me. I was like, "How are you so fit?" And I know you don't like where you are right now. I know because the Type A personality, yeah. the wood gym guy that comes through yeah. here, that you know goes to sleep about getting better, waking up about getting better. That's how I started the show. And that's how I brought all these people on that are constant pushing, pushing. And with Mr. Haslam, it's a good and a bad. If I was one of his sons or daughters, is that it's never enough. He constantly, and that comes. And if I wanted to talk about it deeper with Will Haslam, who done all his research with history of family, it has to come deeper because it's never enough and for years i think mr haslam knows i'm okay now at 51 but for a lot of years what are your numbers like or is it 10 percent higher what what is it from the year before he was always the guy pushing it was not that it was never enough but like oh well harrison's good that's okay but you know is he gonna make pro bowl is he gonna go there so we go back to your fitness is what makes you so fit and i know all the rules and i know the one rule i've been doing pretty good with the one rule, and I really feel a difference of dropping weight. The oxygen feels better, yeah. but that goes back to being a part of watching some of the guys your age from at the pub or in boxes that yeah. are doing the things that you don't do. What makes you, where I've been bragging on it, and, and I created a whole other show, so fit? You go. Well, in the first place, uh, I've never in my life smoked or I've never drank. Now, there's nothing wrong with drinking, but... What I always say is, I look at everything, what's the upside potential and downside risk? So I just figured, you know, I, you know, I would never drink. And I've always exercised. Well, if you exercise enough, and I used to, years ago, run, then I rode a bike, but now I can't do either one. But And then I lifted weights for a long time until my shoulders went bad. But... If you work out and stay fit, you're going to feel better, but you're also going to think better. And I think part of the uh, of being able to think and have an energy and everything, it, it comes back to physical fitness. And if you're 20 or 30 pounds overweight, you you aren't going to think as well. You aren't going to work as well. You know, you aren't going to, any of the things you need to do, you won't do as well. And the people, I, and quite frankly, the happiest people I know are the people who, who work out a lot. You, you train a lot of people. And <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, and, and you know, we, we're going to cover a lot on this. If we have an extra large, are we good like 20 minutes? Is that good? Okay. Because the one thing he always said to me, and and we could go on with all the like the stress of you're in good good shape. Yeah. You could handle more stress. You don't have to go to, you know, three highball drinks at five yeah. because your day was crappy. You yeah. go get your workout and endorphins yeah. release and you get that energy. But I do remember him always saying this is like Charles, don't drink. And I'm like, Pops, but I don't drink and drive. I I try not to drink when I go out, maybe the glass of wine. I go, if I do anything that's more than two, I do it at home. And he goes, Okay, so you think you're doing good doing that? I'm like, yeah. So what's wrong with that? So okay, I get blasted at home. What, what what what's the makeup on that? And he goes, well, let me give a case scenario to you. What if you get a phone call, and Ashlyn, my oldest daughter, you know, needs a ride home at 11:30. Doesn't like the friend that she spends the night with, and they get in an argument. Can you get in a car and take her? And what's, I remember you saying, what's that, the answer to that? 
No, I can't. Okay. <laughs> so you, you shouldn't do it anywhere of getting like that. I just remember you giving me, you know, on and on of the lectures, which I take, you know, because mm-hmm. you became my father. My father was killed in 2003 is, you know, you really listen to that. Then you start going now at 51, you're really not as invincible as you were at 32 or 34. If I could get away, Jimmy and I were talking about on the phone last night. He's like, you eat a piece of pizza. And you put on three pounds. You know, it's totally different. Then you do the alcohol with the sugar. That's fat. And then you can't burn fat because you put sugar in your body. And, you know, forget about the smoking thing. That's one thing I haven't done, thank the Lord. So how have you been so strict with everything you have to go to and entertain and throw the functions? I know the word just saying no, but are you so into health to where that is your release, your drug, so to speak. Yeah, uh, well, f- well, first of all, I think, you know, you got to watch your weight. And I, f- I don't know, for the last 30 or 40 years, I weigh every morning. And now... I I'm, told you guys. <laughs> now I'm down to a ridiculous amount because of all the things... Well, e- even how strict he is now with, with, with your low sodium. Yeah. I mean, your meals are prepped. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and don't eat salt and everything. But I think... You have to always eat properly, you know what I mean? And don't overeat and watch your weight. And then, you know, you got to have to get enough sleep. Like right now, I used to go to bed at 9.30 or 10 and wake up at 5.30. Well, now I don't sleep that well, so I have to sleep later. Lord knows I don't get there as early as I used to. But you got to... You got to watch your weight. You got to watch what you eat. You got to get plenty of sleep, and you have to exercise. And if you do those things, you'll feel so much better, and you'll be a much more productive person. It's it's simple. Do, do you think that the sports made you? Oh yes. that way. Yeah. Did your you father know, stay uh, on yeah. you? Well, I, I just have always been involved in sports, and the advice I would have for parents is this: get your kids involved in team sports not individual sports. And why is that? Okay, you can play tennis and golf all the rest of your life, but you aren't going to be able to play football or soccer or basketball or baseball. It's, you do it when you're young, you're in high school, and you're college. And what do you okay. learn? What, what you learn is this. If you're on a football team and 10 people do a great job and one person doesn't go, play doesn't work. That's what life's all about. You have a team. Okay, we've got, we've got 11 stories out there. You're going up the interstate. I go back to my first thing. If one of those stories isn't any good, you aren't going to stop at the next one. So teamwork, basketball, teamwork, baseball. Football is the ultimate teamwork, but all of them are teamwork. And I think that's what a younger person has to learn, that he or she has to work with other people, and teamwork is important. Now, the rest of your life, you can play golf and tennis and do all those things. But I think in your formative years, you know, I'm a product of playing football, basketball, baseball. (laughs) Yeah, so do you, I mean, and that goes back to what we talk about now that we see, and I see a lot the generation of the athletes I work with is and, and Jimmy uses this word a hundred billion times, accountability oh, yeah. and self-awareness of yeah. not my fault. So do you think the team holds uh, yeah, people accountable? Yeah, I'll I tell you, this is interesting. Rick Barnes, who's one of the most remarkable human beings, not even forget about his coaching ability I've ever been around, was down at Pilot, oh, I don't know, three or four months ago. And, he's, and this is really good. He said, there are four things I have to do. And who's Rick Barnes? Just so everybody knows. Oh, I'm sorry. The Tennessee basketball coach. And, and he's done some really, amazing things. Really last amazing weeks. things. Yeah, he won over 30 games last year. I, I'm sorry. But anyhow, he said, I have to, there are four things. He said, listen. He said, if I don't listen to my players, how can I expect them to listen to me? Pretty good, right? Respect. If I don't respect my players, how can I expect them to respect me? The third is ego. I don't want them to have a big ego, so I can't have a bad ego. The fourth is accountability, which you said Jimmy was talking about. Okay. There are 10 seconds to go in the game. We're down by one. 
I call the play. It doesn't work. That's on me. I call the play. One of my players doesn't execute. I'm going to hold them responsible. But if I call the wrong play, they're going to hold me responsible. Now, you think they're really good lessons for life. We think we know everything. We don't. We got to listen. And you, you have to respect other people. Now, you have to even respect people who have different views from you. They might be right. You know what I mean? And, you know, and then you can't have a big ego. How many athletes you see whose big ego is their downfall? You know what I mean? Yes. Does Chad Pennington have an ego? No. <laughs> Harrison Smith? No. 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 You, know, you know what I mean? Right. They, they don't have big egos. And the fourth, they got to be accountable. If if that person, an athlete, a business person, a person in your family, if he or she messes up, you have to hold them accountable. And if you mess up, they have to hold you accountable. The thing about the biggest thing people don't realize is life is a two-way street. And they're great examples. If you want people to listen to you, you have to listen to them. If you want people to respect you, you have to respect them. If you don't want people to have big egos and think they're hot shots, you can't be that way. And well, you got to hold people accountable. And I think you've inst- instilled that to, and I always go back to Jimmy, the way he works. Mm-hmm. And I always tell people how uber fit he is and how he tries to train mm-hmm. five, six. You know, our big thing that Jimmy and I are on is do more. Yeah. You know, like do more. He works, and I know Laura sees this, he works like he's still trying to get a job at Pilot. And, and that has to come from all those four yeah, or five well, things. Well, and the thing is, if you want, if we expect people to work hard, the people in our top management have to work hard. And we have a deal at Pilot now, we have four values. Number one, we value people. And anything you do, if these people aren't any good, you aren't going to be any good. So we value people. We value people who work hard. If you don't want to work hard, you know, if we have a meeting of people that pile up and bring them all over the country, I say, if you don't want to work hard, you know, we flew you in here, we'll get you a bus ticket back home, if you understand what I mean. <laughs> do you notice that? Yeah. You don't fly back out. <laughs> and And number three... You have to work together. You got to have everybody here working together, okay? And number four, you have to expect results. So, you get good people. You work hard. You work together. You'll get results. And that's what we talked about. And I know I bring Jimmy up again because it, it's it's a whole family unit of what you guys do. Is when he did take on the Browns. I mean, I he'd sit right on the end end of the bench, and I'm like, "What have you learned the last couple of years? Like the first couple of years, he was working uh, with the Browns." And he said, "I learn, I have a lot to learn from this." And he goes, "What do you think the difference is?" And that's when we talked to Chad so much because he could help yeah. the insights of talking about the culture, the culture of the team. You hear that all the time. Yeah. And I said, Jimmy, and and Chad said this. You know, he wasn't up there full time, so they didn't really know. Jimmy and his work ethic yeah. and he didn't even work out down in the weight room like he does now yeah. and I think the team has taken on a whole different yeah because he works out and works hard and everything and, and they see that they yeah. see it a pilot but they didn't see it yeah. they thought he was the owner that came yeah. in and Pennington had yeah. all the the names and the slogans or whatever yeah. everything was yeah and 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 you know uh uh <laughs> the biggest thing you learn in pro football is you have to have a quarterback and it's kind of interesting when you think about, we're kind of getting off the subject here, but when you think about, you know, who should you draft first? Well, you ought to draft a quarterback, but then who else beside a quarterback makes a difference, okay? A rush lineman gets a sack, okay? A defensive back, he gets an interception, Okay? An offensive left tackle, he protects the quarterback. You see what I mean? Yeah. Okay. A wide receiver, he can make a a long play. They're the people you want to draft first. Because if you don't have those people, 
The other people you can get by with average players. You can't get by with average at those five positions. I like that. Interesting. Yeah. And you talk about teamwork. Yeah, and you got you got to work together. You know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, and you have to get a certain culture. The Browns didn't have that culture. They're getting it now. Belichick's got the culture in New England. You know what I mean? How long has Belichick been there? Oh gosh, he's been in New England. Well, uh, he hadn't been there. He'd been there maybe 20 years. Yeah. Right there. Right. Yeah. 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 Do you like well, his style? Brady's been the quarterback for 18 years. Yeah. So and Pete Bledsoe was through. He'd been there 22 or three years, probably. Yeah. You know, he's with the Browns and couldn't make it. You know, something interesting we were talking about the other day. Uh, if I, we okay? If I'd say, who's the best? Coach in pro football, you'd say Belichick. Mm-hmm. Who's the best coach in college football? Saban. Who's the best coach in college basketball? Well, you go with the Duke coach. I Krzyzewski, would. Right? okay. Say, uh, Belichick was so bad, the Browns fired him. After three years, they were about, uh, Duke had an athletic director like Krzyzewski, but they hung him in effigy when he lost to Carolina. Saban lost the Louisiana Tech, his first year. You know what I mean? You have to have patience with coaches because it takes a while for them to get their culture installed. You understand what I mean? I do, and I think that goes back to some of the podcasts that I'm listening to all the time. The beginning. Yeah. The novice making the mistakes of... Yeah, hey, you're going to make know. mistakes as a coach and everything. But remember this. What's the first game, Maxwell? The team that makes the fewest mistakes wins. And they got to capitalize on the yeah, mistakes yeah. from the other Play team. for them, make the breaks, one comes your way. Score. Lucky break. Lucky breaks. I like lucky. I've gotten a lot of lucky breaks in my life. Yes. 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 To where you are. To where I am is a succession of lucky things happening to me. Now, people that don't know this, the viewers, listeners out there, and Laura knows this, and she's probably the only one in this room that understands this. For years, if he trained at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 9.30, this man would not come in gym clothes through the front door. I don't know. I'm going to give one insight to everybody out there, and I'll leave it that personal for anybody else. He would be fully dressed. He always he reminded me of the like the Bear Bryants of the world, of just so classy and so hard nosed. He'd be fully dressed, go upstairs because sometimes I'd go up see him. Hey, you coming? He would undress, gym clothes, and then come back down, and you could hear him coming three floors up because he was talking to everybody. This man is about as humble as they get. For everything that he's done and produced, all great children. I, you know, trained them all and their kids. It's 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 amazing what he has done. But I do have one question. <laughs> have, you, have you ever had a hangover? No. no. Oh, question. Have you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> did really. you ever say why did I do this? Yes, and I okay. always go, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> Mr. Hey, 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 tell him the advice I, I told you when your father died. <laughs> oh, that story. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll make that. And then we can wrap it up because I know he's so, so busy. And he won't sit in the wood gym anymore with no sign. I got yelled at again from Laura. I always get yelled at. Her. Okay. So I, I get a phone call. Uh, my father was in a motorcycle accident. And they're going to pull the plug on him. And I'm training people at the time. And I get this phone call. And I have to go back downstairs at Hamburg Place. I had a two-story. Remember, yeah, you come yeah, over and eat yeah. at Bogart's. We had yeah. a blast over there. And I go, holy smokes. I got to go downstairs and turn it on for these guys. Tim Irwin was in there, a judge here in town and a sports agent. Played 18 years in the NFL. And uh, he knew. And he gave me a big hug. I'm like, don't hug me. Don't hug me. Stevie Bailey, your son-in-law, gave me a big hug. Don't hug me. Because it'll make me cry. I got to stay, stay tough. And I was like, I got to call and cancel four o'clocks for Mr. Haslam. Well, at that time, he was getting the plane ready for me to fly up and pull the plug on my father. And it was going to take a couple hours. And I was like, well, 
I guess I'll get home, go home and get sauced up and numb and, you know, go do what I have to do. And this Mr. I was so mad at him. I mean, there were some names I was going over. So I called and go pops. I'm not coming over. I'm going to go home and, you know, just wait on the plane. He said, bullshit, son. He goes, you're going to come over here and train me. It's the best thing you'll ever do is come over here and train me. And I thought at that point, you son of a bitch, you heartless. You know, I was going like not off on him, but going, you're going to make me drive from Hamburg place over to your place and load weights, spot them. You look great. Let's weigh and do everything. And it was the best piece of advice I ever gotten from this man. So, Mr. Haslam, thank you so much for coming on. I can't, I can't thank you enough. You're, you are like a father to me, and your family has been so awesome and so loyal. And talk about a lucky break when your old trainer, Carlos, that's another story. Your old trainer, Carlos, calls me up and tells me I, I got a guy that might want to work out with you. I'm changing businesses. I had to take his old trainer, and I was this close, Laura, because I was still in that New Jersey Italian swag of like, who in the F for you to come in here? And I'm going to work out you so I could train some business guy to see if I know what I'm doing to train this guy. And it was one of the best things I ever did. And thank you, Carlos, wherever you are for coming in and me <laughs> sucking it up and working with others of going, I'm going to do this anyway. I don't know where it's going to lead. And it led to one of the best things happened in my life. Thank you. And I love you so much. God bless you, my... buddy. Thank You're you the so best. much. Thank, thank you. you. That wasn't bad, it wasn't. No. Yeah. <laughs> that was <laughs>